So as I mentioned, just to begin with Hussain Kanar, we are, um, well, Sage essentially called us an ISV or an independent software vendor. We are a developer partner of Sage 200. So it means that we're accredited to create add-ons into the Sage solution. Now, we've been doing that as a business for in excess of 20 years. We only develop for Sage 200. We don't sell direct, we sell through the partner community with Richard and Darren and the team at EBS being a, a key partner of Cycons for many years now. Now, the reason for starting on the website is feel free to visit uh, cycon.co.uk after today. Not trying to get hits, there's a wealth of information for you to uh, absorb. But what you'll see on the first screen is, I mean, all of these add-ons we do for Sage, the ones we're going to be focusing on today, just towards the bottom, but by no less means important as the ones above it, will be the WAP modules. And what you can do with any of those is, uh, for example, we pick purchase requisitions. You can click on the link. There's a couple of videos there, older versions now. We do need to update some of those, but again, the principle is still the same. But there's help and user guides. So as you scroll down, there's screenshots and descriptions of what we're going to go through. So it's a, it's a great, great resource. So the first question is, what is WAP? Now it stands for Web Authorization Processor. Essentially, you're devolving responsibility out to your end users. Uh, so probably more so uh, given given the last 12 months, you know, very much more now a diverse remote workforce. So not necessarily people sat in the office as you, you know, able to uh, sign things as you pass bits of paper around. So the idea yeah, is you're devolving, devolving that um, the authorization out using web technology. Likewise, for a lot of organizations, there's a, du a doubling up of the admin time. So for example, expenses, I'm keying it into a spreadsheet, printing that off, stapling my receipts, putting it in the post to my line manager for them to sign it, put it in the post then to the head office and somebody in head office manually typing it in. Utilizing something uh, or one of the modules within the WAP, I can do that electronically, record my receipts electronically, that can go through to be approved remotely before then updating and pushing the information in Sage. And that's really the principle there is whilst WAP WAP wraps around, that's not as easy to say as you think, whilst WAP wraps around Sage 200, it is actually communicating real time. So what we'll do is we'll talk just a bit about the login and the licensing and that for WAP. We'll have a look around and a bit of a look and feel, and then we'll go through some of those modules and see how they interact with Sage 200. So WAP is accessed from a web portal. Uh, now I personally use it on my MacBook in Chrome and Safari, on my iPad the same, uh, it works in Microsoft Edge. There is actually a WAP app as well, which uh, is available for iOS and Android. Now. If you want to use it external, you will need to, because WAP is installed in the same environment as your Sage 200 solution, you will need to sit it behind an SSL certificate and poke a little hole in the firewall. It's about, about as technical as I get on these things, um, but essentially it'll become a HTTPS address. So it does mean then anyway, you've got an internet address or internet connection and the appropriate browser, you'll be able to access that. If it is external facing and it's set up correctly, then you can use the app as well. For some customers, they don't want to expose it to the uh, you know, uh, external. So in which case you can deploy it internally, you would just need to be dialed in via VPN or on the network. In that instance, you wouldn't be able to use the WAP app. The killer question here is often, do I have to, uh, do they have to be a Sage 200 user as well? And the answer is no. So you don't have to have a Sage 200 license to be able to log into WAP. So WAP has its own user named user licenses, and then you purchase the appropriate modules. Now, the first time that person logs in, so once you've set them up and they log in, they'll be asked to change their password, and then they're presented with this screen. Now I've just logged in as the admin user. Now from a look and feel perspective, if I go over to the menu, these are all the module options. So as I said, it is modular. You only need to purchase the ones that are relevant for how you want to work uh, initially and the good news is any modules you haven't purchased or that you haven't got permission to see will not appear in the menu so you're not going to have people saying why can't I click on this so the first one uh, we're going to touch on would be requisitions we can then look at purchase invoice approvals and expenses those are the top three most um, most bought and used modules we've then got some other extensions so for customers who want to be able to onboard sales orders uh, but approve you're not going to approve every sales order but approve based on uh, those that are outside of a margin or an acceptable margin we've got an option there 
timesheet capture. So it does integrate in with our Cycon projects. It does uh, interface with Sage Project Accounting as well. So for capturing time, most people use it for capturing time against uh, against projects typically. There's a holidays module. So uh, being able to set up your entitlement and, and approve those uh, and then sending an ICAL out for your, uh, for your calendar and being able to track what's remaining in that entitlement. And again, this is where it does start to then combine. If you've got timesheets, that's then going to populate the holiday in your timesheet as well. And then we have a mini HR module, uh, which again, just being able to capture pertinent details. But as I said, what we will do is we'll start with requisition. So that's pre-purchase order. Go through for approval once you get a purchase order you can good to receive as well purchase invoice authorization so matching your invoice or invoices put straight to the ledger coming out for approval as well and then expenses uh, which i discussed earlier central area here is the notification so the whole principle behind wap is approvals so when i submit a requisition you'll have pre-built an approval route for that to then go through based on the logic and we'll talk about the options a little bit later the person who needs to approve it, or persons, depending on how it's set up, will receive an email uh, notifying them there's items to approve. Now, they can't approve it from the email. Uh, two reasons. One, it's not the most secure. But second is there's a lot of information that we want them to observe before making that decision. But there is a link that would take them through to the web portal. And when they log in, they'll then see a list of items that they need to action. If they're going to be off on annual leave, or out the business for a period of time, we can turn on the out of office functionality and you'd set up, you wouldn't give them all of these options, but you'd set up a, a user who could be their alternate user whilst they're, um, whilst they're out of the office. And if I'm sorry, bring that back up. So they select it, click on out of office and uh, in their absence, any requisitions, for example, that are sent through to them would be redirected to that person in their absence. Upon their return, they can simply switch that off. Now, if you've got a memory like mine, you probably forget to turn that on. So a user with admin privileges could come into the system settings. Or alternatively, we do have something called delegate functionality. So what delegate is, uh, again, you're in control of this. So once you give someone delegate access, they can assume control of other users whom they've been given access to. So what I mean by that is there's a list of other WAP users that uh, I'm allowed to assume control of. So if I select Corey, I'm actually logged in now as Corey and I could turn on his out of office. I could also approve items or raise requisitions, uh, submit expenses, whatever it is on behalf of Corey, but I can't stitch him up. It will say Steve Gemmett has approved on behalf of Corey Robinson. So again, it's, the whole idea here is it's great using technology. But what you don't want is technology to then become a bottleneck because people aren't uh, around in the business. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of the look and feel. Now, user wise today, uh, my main user is going to be somebody called Sandra, who's an employee who's going to raise a requisition, submit expenses, etc. Corey is my main approver, but again, we'll talk about the approval routes. There are also options which Sandra doesn't have permission to do, but you can give uh, users permission to request new suppliers. So you build an approval route behind that. They fill in the details that they know. That could be multi-level. It could go through to somebody in purchasing then through to the uh, finance manager, finance director, until such time as the final approver says yes, it would then create that purchase ledger account in Sage. Now, in this instance, we don't want Sandra to be able to do that. So for her user type, and it's very similar to Sage, where Sage has got roles, features and users. So the role, you then assign what areas of Sage they've got access to and then allocate your users. WAP is very similar. We've got user types and then you say, what can those user types do? So again, you can start to restrict things. So Sandra's going to come in today and she wants to create a new requisition. So she comes in, clicks on new requisition again. Obviously, as we said, this could be inside or it could be external facing. Now, for those of you who've got multiple Sage 200 companies, the great news is WAP will wrap around all of those Sage companies. There's no extra cost. The only additional charges might be users to obviously access those and additional resource just to support you with the implementation. Now, in terms of what you can do in that instance, Sandra can raise requisitions to two different companies uh, in, in, in that Sage site license. Now, the rules would be one requisition per supplier per company submitted at a time, uh, just as it would be in Sage. You have to log into that company, raise a PO, pick a supplier, and then you're raising a PO for that person. So, but it does mean she could operate in, in, in multiple. In most, in kind of my experience, most customers know you're going to be linked to one company. 
But if we flip that round then for the approvers, you might have the finance director camping in approval routes for multiple stage 200 companies. We've got clients with sort of 17, 20 plus companies doing that. So, and again, the system's able to handle that. Now, from a Steve Jemmett company, this list of suppliers is actually coming from Sage. I don't have to mirror them. There's no setup of those inside of WAP. There's no duplication. So if you were to add a new supplier in Sage, they would automatically be pulled through to WAP. Now, if I pick, uh, should we go for, let's go for CGS Portsmouth will do today. So if I pick those and I go over to the delivery and invoicing address, the key suppliers address, as well as key contacts have been pulled through. So I could overwrite that if I need to. Delivery address, you've got a multitude of options, depending again on what permissions you want to switch on. You can set up a number of delivery addresses inside of WAP and then set a default for a user, but they can pick alternates. You can allow me to select a supplier, so perhaps I'm going to pick it up from that supplier, so I could pick the supplier's address, or again, it could be screw fix, there might be a local depot rather than the head office. Customer, so for sales ledger, perhaps I'm going to ship it to uh, the customer site ready for one of our engineers. If you're using Sycon projects and you've set up a project address, then we can pick projects. If you're not using projects in any of any project costing, then that won't appear. And then you can also have a free text address as well. Now the types of items we can put on, all of this mirrors what you've got in a Sage purchase order. So if I come in and add stock item lines, as you'd expect, I'll just turn that off there. As I start to type, it's gonna do a smart search, not only with the item code, but of course searching even down to the suppliers part as well. So if I pick my professional blender, stock item details, so the locations from the stock record in Sage, the buying units and the price, it's all flowing through, even down to the nominal that you've set up against that particular stock item. I'll touch on the projects tab in a moment. If you're not using stock and we've got a number of customers don't, then you can simply hide that option uh, from the user type and just say, no, they're not gonna, um, they're not gonna use that option. From a free text line, which is what I'm going to put on today, as you'd expect, I can put whatever I want. So we'll just go for a laptop. Um, we'll have one laptop, 750 pounds. When do I want it? So we'll have it uh, tomorrow. Now, because I've got Sycon projects switched on, or as I say, it could be project accounting, uh, I can pick a project. Again, if you haven't got any uh, project costing, that, that option just wouldn't be there. And then from a nominal perspective, you do have to pick a nominal. Now you've got three options. You could lock it down so there's a default nominal, it will always be that nominal that that person would buy, buy to, highly unlikely. Second option is you could give that person access to pick from the long list of nominals in your, in your ledger. Again, all of that flows through from Sage, so there's no double, double setup. Again, highly unlikely you're gonna do that. What most customers will do is they will set up a truncated list of nominals. Now these three columns, they mean nothing to most users, but a description makes sense. So is it materials? So I've got, I think I've got seven or eight in mind. So it could be entertainment, IT. So I just pick the appropriate nominal. So we'll save that. It's gonna stay on this particular screen. So I'm just gonna put, I want a case as well. And we'll do 50 pound for a nice case. Get that in tomorrow. So as you'd expect, nothing, nothing different. And again, I can just pick the appropriate area for that as well. So there's a couple of lines on my requisition, nothing revolutionary, just what you'd expect. But of course, I'm, or I'm, well, I'm Sandra today, uh, who's raising raising this without anybody having to rekey it. I've got other options, I can flag it as urgent. Now, um, mine is broken. So whatever that urgent reason is, now we can't control somebody actually flagging this. Uh, so you need to define to, to people, you know, when they should use it and when they shouldn't. Uh, it's not something that we can control, but it does have an important feature. So it is going to highlight that it's urgent. That's the first thing. But also I mentioned the email notifications. You can define the frequency of those. So uh, perhaps at an operational level, we want them hourly. As you move up to a more senior, senior level, typically you don't want lots of emails coming through. So just group all of those where I need to action into one notification per day. This though can be set up to override that so it would go out immediately. We can also add additional justifications. So, um, uh, uh, mine's old, whatever that is, mine is old. And you can add attachments. So it might be that uh, I've already spoken to the supplier, so I've got their best quote and I've got that quote here. So I could just drag 
drop that onto the attachments. Now, if I'm doing this on an iPad, when I click there, so with the latest iOS, you can go to a to a to a folder, or it might be I've taken a screenshot of my photos. There's also options for order um, justification where you can force them to attach a certain number of attachments based on the value of the total requisition. So less than 10,001, 10 to 52, etc. Anyway, there's my order. At the bottom, I've got some options where I could, I could have copied a previously approved order. I can actually email a quote request. So from within the system, uh, we can put your logo on there. So we've got uh, the layout here with the line items on it. If I click at the top, if providing you've got your SMTP details and all that set up, I could email out from here and I could email it to a number of suppliers if I wanted to, you know, to get the best price, get a quote. Save only sits as a draft and save and submit goes out for approval. Now, I'm spending a bit of time kind of on the first module because it does cover the principles for all of the others and that those principles are uh, from a um, an approval route perspective. Now, each module has different uh, different criteria that you can select. So for requisitions, we can, most customers, I think again in my experience, will they'll build the approved routes based on the nominal. So perhaps grouping the cost center or the department. So everything from our sales nominal goes through to Darren, everything from an operational one goes through to Richard. That could be multi-level, so it goes, um, and that can also be based on, on value. So we could give Darren uh, an approval limit of a thousand pounds. So if it's less than that, Darren approves it, it's gonna flow through and do the actions in Sage. If it's more than that, still goes to Darren. Darren approves it, but then it would go through to the next person and so on until somebody with the appropriate level of approval signs that off. We can do it on requesting user. So Darren's goes through to Richards. We can do it based purely on value. So anything less than £10,000 goes to person A, etc. If you've got Cyclone projects, then we can do it by a project manager that you've set on the project. Um, or if you've got Cycon projects or project accounting, you could do it based on the project number. So plenty of options. It does differ. So with timesheets, for example, the options would be typically requesting user or project. Holidays will always be requesting user. Expenses um, could be nominal, it could be, could be value, but again, most of the time it goes to your line manager. So they do differ based on the modules, but the principle is the same. And I'll show you at the end how you would build those approval routes. Now, in my example today, my approval, as I've said earlier, is a gentleman by the name of Corey. So Corey uh, logs in, he's either clicked on the link onto the login page, but he's logged in. If we scroll down and I go to the last page just here, is it the last page or is it, sorry, he's got far too many. I'm just trying to find, no, don't worry about that. Let's just go straight to the top here and click. Um, it is demonstration data after all. So there's the requisition that we were just submitted. So we can see the order date. We can see there's no PO at the moment. If we scroll to the left, the delivery address, the values, who requested it, the supplier, etc. There's the urgent flag, so I can see it's uh, there's urgent. It's actually over budget, and we'll come on to budgets as well in a moment because it can analyse project budgets if you've obviously got project or nominal budgets as well. We can see we printed the quote. There's the justification. There's an attachment, and there's the line items on there. Now because of the way or the flexibility of what you can configure, it is possible for a single requisition to go out to multiple people at the same time. It's only once everybody's approved that, will it then flow through to Sage. So all Corey does is he just expands this and he can then see the lines. Now, the reason they are, these are a peachy color is because both lines are over budget. So if I come over to the budgets tab, I've got projects, but budget set up so I can see it succeeded. I say a lot of customers will use nominal budgets. So if you are setting nominal budgets in Sage, our system can be configured to look at that nominal, either the month, the year, today, or the annual, and then start to compare. And if it's over the budget, then it can highlight it as over budget, as we've seen in the example here. In that scenario, you can also configure the approval routes where it's over budget, it must go to the managing director, or it could go out to five board members, so long as three of them approve that, and we don't care which three, it can then flow through. So again, we can start to just add in a few extras. But the other side of it from the approver, and again, I don't know if you have this scenario, but we get a lot of feedback from, from customers where the budget holders are constantly contacting finance, going, what have we got left in our budget? Where are we with the budget? You know, what transactions have we had put through? So again, we can present this to them dynamically. So as I click down and drill down onto that, I can see what the budget is, what we've actually spent in the current financial year, 
anything sat in deferred. The value of any lines linked to this nominal of purchase orders that are still outstanding. We can see the value of any WAP requisitions that um, have yet to be approved, pending invoices, etc. And then we can see what's remaining in that budget. And if you want to give them permission, you can, they can click on the view transactions. And actually for those nominals, which obviously they're restricted to see, they can then see the transactions as well, um, drilling down and have a look at the details. Anyway, let's get back to some of the other features that we can see. I mentioned the attachments earlier, so we can click on the link and view the quote attachment. Have a look there, I could download the PDF. All the justification will be here. I can see the justification notes and there's an approval history as well. So date and timestamp as it starts, as it's approved, as it's rejected. So we've got a mini audit trail. Now the options that Corey has is he can approve or reject individual lines. If he rejects, he has to give a reason why, and that would then go back to uh, Sandra. So it might be that we're going to allow Sandra the laptop, but she's not spending that on a case. So we reject it, put the reason in. The requisition pauses. Sandra then adjusts that, finds a um, another case from this supplier, changes the unit price and resubmits it. That one line carries through until it catches up with the rest and then it carries on. Alternatively, the rejection might be you've already got a case. No, you know, we're not, I'm not signing that off. In which case, if Sandra deletes that line and resubmits, it will instantly jump ahead. Now, I'm just going to approve all for this. Sandra gets an email notification telling her that it's been approved by Corey and then that it's gone on to um, uh, the next person in the chain, for example, or it might be that it's been fully approved. And congratulations, you've got your PO. So Sandra logs back in. Now she can come down into completed. And if we scroll to the bottom, somewhere in there, uh, wherever it is, might be on multiple pages, CJS. One of those has been fully authorized by Corey. I think it's that one there. If I click on it, we can then see the details. That's not the office desk. Oh, we'll find the one I did in a moment, but you're going to get a PO number from Sage immediately. So let's just go through into our menu, existing requisitions. And if we look at a look at the approved tab there, there's the one that I've just put on for Sandra with the details on there, fully authorized by Corey. And we can actually see if I I can either edit it or I can drill down and look at the project summary. It's only once it's fully approved does it post as a purchase order inside of Sage 200. If I just refresh this, CGS, there's our PO with today's date. So 37.95 and if I just view that, laptop and case, we can see the line levels. If we come up here at the WAP order, we can see it was raised by Sandra. So basically what's happened is once it's been fully approved, Sandra's now received notification and she's got a PO number, but it's all been controlled through the approval routes. And then yeah, back in WAP, we can print a, print a summary here. We can actually email out a copy of that PO to the supplier. So hopefully you're starting to see the benefits there of joining this process up, but you're not losing control. Now, one of the other options that Sandra has is she can also goods receive. Now you don't have to, and this is probably the contentious one because it's hard enough getting people to uh, do paperwork at the best of time, let alone tell you that they've received that laptop. But if you can, it's great for the finance department if you switch on. So I've got three way matching switched on. And to be fair, it's, I've come from a corporate world where it was drummed in. That was the only way that you could get uh, get anything, get anything through. But I appreciate every every company's different. And this is, of course, a cultural change. You know, when when you roll something like this out, so it does take a bit of time. But with that switched on, Sandra comes in, says, yep, I want to receive the items so she could fully receive. She could part receive. So again, all the things you'd expect. There's also this option up here which we can switch on. So perhaps uh, Sandra ordered three laptops and two of them have arrived and the supplier says, unfortunately, can't get any more of that type of laptop. So we're going to we're not going to be receiving anything else. So Sandra can actually flag that as a final receipt. And when she confirms the, uh, the goods received side of things, what it will do is it will update the value on the PO and in, in Sage and in WAP to tidy things up for you as well. But of course, you've got that audit trail. 
So I'm just going to receive all of it. You do have to put your document number in just as Sage would accept. If I click on save, are we sure? Now it doesn't have to be Sandra. You can put them into uh, users into business units. So it, you know, it might be uh, somebody else in the business unit does the goods receipt. But this is great. Um, question we often get is, well, what about the warehouse stuff? Well, if you've got a barcoding solution, leave them anything coming into the warehouse, receive it that way. Or if you've got a process, um, I would do that. But where this really comes in is Sandra's a home worker. We've ordered a laptop for her. She can then take receipt because you know it's not coming via the warehouse. But again, you can uh, make up your own use decision. So what we're going to do, go back into Sage. Let me just refresh that. And if I view my PO again, I can see that's updated the received quantities. So that's requisitions. There's a lot more I could go through, but I'm going to just pause that there for a moment and we're going to move into the purchase invoice module. Now, they're separate modules, so some customers will stop where we are with requisitions and that's that's good enough. We've got some customers will just buy the purchase invoice authorization and then we've got others will buy both, but you can add, you know, you can add as you go. Now, from a purchase invoice perspective, it actually starts in stage. So one of the first things that we would configure if it's not already set up, Sage is standard feature, which is this setting here. Now this setting is, do we want to use authorization? Yes, we do. Now I've actually enabled it that if it's less than 1500, I can choose whether or not it goes out for approval. A lot of customers will set this to a penny where you've got these modules installed from, from Sycon so that every invoice goes out for approval. You would also then set up an unauthorized nominal Typically, it's a balance sheet, but it could be a P&L nominal. So what Sage does is when it's flagged as requiring authorization, it posts to that unauthorized nominal. Now, whether we're matching the invoice to the PO or whether it's just posting straight to the ledger, the output's the same in terms of um, if it's posted to that unauthorized, WAP is going to pick it up. So all I'm going to do for my PO is I'm just going to record the invoice. Because I've goods received, we can see which WAP user goods received it as well. So that's a nice bit of visibility there. And I'm going to put the value, so 80160. And I'm going to post the invoice. There is a setting as well with uh, the WAP invoice approvals configured where if there is a variance, it pops up, you enter a reason, and we actually create then a variance nominal, which uh, will post that variance details. That can come out to WAP and, and that nominal can be changed, but I'll show you where that is shortly. So this is the tick box we're on about, and because I've been using Sycon projects, um, I can see the details on this tab, but again, if you're not using projects, that's not going to be there. But one thing we have done is this nominal narrative from a PO. With WAP, there is a setting where we can pull down the description from the nominal line into the nominal narrative, and again, that's a big hit when we put that in with, uh, with customers. Because I've got Sycon documents installed, I can again, utilize that to drag and drop and store a digital copy of the invoice. If you've got Dracer's document capture from the purchase invoice perspective of what I'm just showing you now, that does get pulled up as well and is visible inside of WAP. It's the only area though where we've got some integration, but I'm using I'm using our I'll just drag and drop and I'm going to post my invoice. Now ignore that I've got uh, I've got other Sycon modules installed. And that's how our invoice posted. Now there's a couple of sub settings in WAP. So what's actually happened if we just have a look at the transaction inquiry is from a Sage perspective, that's now sat with the query, and we can see down here sat in the unauthorized purchases. And whilst it's there, it will not appear on the suggested payments row. From a WAP perspective, that's now picked it up. There's two settings, as I mentioned. The first one is if the PO, the goods received and the invoice all match, WAP can simply post it back. So we've already approved the PO. The value of the invoice is within what we've received an invoice, so we don't need to approve it, send it back. You can also set up a tolerance, so inside 2% or three pounds, whichever is the smallest amount. Again, WAP can say, well, that's inside of that tolerance. Let's just automatically approve it. Anything outside that needs to flow through. For purchase invoices, as you post those, those would just flow through. So in our example, that's going to go back out to Corey. It's the same principle as before in that Corey's going to receive an email. From an approval route's perspective, they are separate to the requisitions. So again, typically it's, 
it's based on the nominal and the things that we spoke about earlier. But again, they can be different because you might bypass the requisitioner. You know, it might just go straight to the um, head of department or the budget holder. So Corey receives that email. All the same things as before. Now it is demonstration data. Corey's not lazy. He just uh, uh, he's got a lot of invoices that uh, that he needs to approve. But what we can see is there at the top is the one that I've put through. As you can see the due date for that over budget as we saw before there's an attachment and there's the lines so as i expand it what it does is i'll show you in a moment it's going to show you a copy of that invoice so that's the first thing that's always quite key is they can see that scanned copy but also using the documents it's stored a copy of the document on the server and put a link in the database so again you can find that easily at a later stage I can see the lines. I can add notes if I know this is going to go through to Darren, for example. We've got your budgets, then you've got your approval history. But the most important thing, in my opinion, here is you can see which Sage 200 user posted this. So if I need to speak to somebody in finance, I know who to who to uh, target that to. Now, one of the options is this edit button. You can switch it off. Now, probably not with a purchase order, although with the variance line that I mentioned. It works perfectly for that, but we do get some feedback from clients where uh, just a plain purchase invoice comes in and the finance department don't necessarily know the specific nominal that the budget holder wants it coded to. So with all this installed, they will pick a, a uh, just a nominal that they know would go through to Richard. They would post it to that. When it comes through to Richard, he can click the edit button, change the nominal from the list of truncated nominals that we've given him permission to, to change. When it's been fully approved and it credits and debits, it will debit that final nominal that he's chosen. So again, it's just a way of keeping things tidy. Corey can also hold the invoice and notify other users just with a message, so he needs to speak to the supplier. He can drill down and then drill down further to look at the requisition, approve or reject. If you reject this time, you have to give a message, but it stays in WAP. So you build a default rejection route typically to somebody inside of the um, purchase ledger team. They can then build a custom route or they could change something so it redirects to the appropriate person. But I'm going to approve all. As before, multiple people, it's going to keep going through, keep going through. And then once it's been fully approved, I come back into Sage, go into the suppliers list, uh, CGS Portsmouth. We look at the transaction inquiry. Our query flags disappeared. If we look at the nominal, there's our credit and debit. And there's the nominal description that I was talking about earlier now. There's a couple of other utilities with the purchase invoice side of things. One of the first ones is inside the WAP add-ons folder. We've got a self-reversing journal. So you get to month end. Now you could run a report in WAP and find out who you need, who's still got to approve invoices and obviously get them to do that before month end. Or here's a list of all of those transactions currently sat in the unauthorized, so all of those invoices. Set a journal date and a reversing date. Send it to a held journal if you wish. When you process that, credit debit, debit credit, and you can do your month end routine. Now I've never worked in a finance or finance, as I heard it called in London once department. So I've never had to do this, but I do know it always puts a smile on the face of, uh, of customers when, uh, when, they, when they see this piece of functionality. The other thing that you get is, and again, it's an optional option to switch it on within the purchase invoice uh, module is, and the question often arises, well, that's great. So we've gone electronic with our requisitions, if you take that module, and uh, that's been approved. We've recorded the invoice and we're using the Sycon documents to attach our purchase invoice. Going electronic, our managing director is uh, is working from home, so they get an email, they can approve it. That's fantastic. But we get to at the end of every week, if it's weekly or whether you do monthly payment runs and we print off the suggested payments report and the managing director wants to see a hard copy or see a copy of the invoice. So if we go digital with the invoices, we're going to have to be printing them out or keep duplicate copies. So what we've added into WAP as well is when you generate your suggested payments run, we've got functionality which can pull that out to be approved in WAP. And whilst it's out to be approved, if we try to pay, and let's pick BGT will do, 
it will stop you telling you that it needs to be approved. So when that comes out to WAP, and it's just another user that I've got, which is Suzanne, who heads up that department. Suzanne gets this option here for approved payments. And again, it could be um, that you can do this on uh, supplier or value, I think are the two options, but you can have it going out to a couple of people. But as we expand the list here, we can then see copies of those invoices. So that's great, which have been stored. And if I click on the view details, we can also enable them to, just as you can with the amend suggested payments, say actually we're going to pay half of that. We're not going to pay that particular line. So then when it's approved, it will then release it inside of Sage. So it's just another way to control. If we quickly move on to expenses now, this is my favourite module. If it's not too sad to have a favourite module, not because I like doing expenses. I am a typical salesperson. I don't like doing admin. That said, it does make my life easier. I've worked for the company for nearly seven years. For the first three years, I worked from home before I relocated to, uh, to Suffolk. I've never handed in a hard copy receipt and I've always used this module. So from an expenses perspective, Sandra logs in. Now she is linked to a purchase ledger account for her own personal expenses. So once they're approved, it will post to that uh, ledger account as an invoice so we can then pay that through Sage. We also deal with corporate credit cards, but I'll touch on that shortly. So Sandra is all set up and the idea is you just want to come on and be able to put your invoices and in. I'm not worry about what rate should, you know, is my mileage, et cetera. Have I done my 10,000 miles? So we do split it into two. So I'm going to touch on mileage first. With, with mileage, you can set up a declaration. So, you know, have I got the correct insurance, fit to drive, et cetera, et cetera. You can turn that off if you want to. And then we come into this screen. So if it's a company vehicle, you can set up the pence per mile based on the HMRC fuel rate. Should those change, a user with admin privileges can log into the back end, put in an effective from date and then change those rates. And depending on the date of the transaction, it's then going to use the appropriate rate. Sandra doesn't have to worry about that. Likewise, if it's a private vehicle, it's going to calculate the business mileage in the current financial year. As soon as that hits 10,000 miles, it would then automatically switch to the lower rate. So again, haven't got to worry about that, uh, that, that, that information. I can just keep putting my expenses on. So I'll pick uh, my Volvo, click on new line, and you present it with this screen. So the date of the journey, so let's just say I, I traveled on Tuesday. Uh, number of passengers, is there a receipt? I'll touch on that shortly. If there's a project that's going to appear again, if not, then that's going to be switched off and you can make this mandatory. Nominal, you set that up against the, the mileage or the expense type for the other side of it and then link that to a user. And then down here, we've also got an option for Google Map integration. You will need your own Google API account and they will ask for your credit card, but uh, at the time of speaking, they give you a, um, a value of uh, credit each month. So I don't know many people who actually go over that. Um, I, th I think the last count was about $200. So it might, might have changed, but um, again, we use it ourselves without actually costing us anything. But you do need to set that up and then put the key in the background. So I can set up favorites, but I can put, uh, we'll search for the Cycon office. So Cycon Limited should be uh, in here somewhere. There we go. That's the Cycon office. And I'm going to go, there we go. We're going to go to EBS. Is it return journey? Yes, it is. Do I need to take off my regular commute? No, I'm going from the office. Click on calculate and it goes off and works out the quickest route, not necessarily the shortest. So you wouldn't hopefully go from north to south London through the middle of you use one of the ring roads. Now, often feedback is, but well, I didn't do that journey. So you could put waypoints in there. So perhaps it wasn't just a straight. I went and saw some other clients as well, or there was a detour. So in that scenario, you can switch it on. So we've used Google Maps, but I can then click on the amend and I can actually put in what mileage I want to claim. So from your perspective, get them to put in here the journey details. So meeting with Richard, can't spell Richard, still can't spell Richard and Darren. Should have just said meeting with Darren, that's easier. Um, but if you were audited, you can see, well, that's what Google Maps says, but they're claiming for this and then get them to put the description in there because you will still see the journey details on that tab. 
all I do is click on save. Oh, I do need to pick a, I do need to pick a project. So let me just uh, select, just select one of my, uh, what have I got in here? There you go, that one will do. That will do there. Uh, let's pick a header of expense. So it's just how my system's configured. If I save that, that's my line. I could keep adding my lines and there's my mileage done. So for me personally, although I'm not traveling at the moment, a huge time saver. For all other expense types, again, in the background of the system, it's all about the setup. You configure what types of expenses they can claim, and then you assign the appropriate ones to the user. So if I don't need to fly, then don't give me the option. As I select, we can display the, the policy. Now we don't typically restrict the policy because there's always extenuating circumstances. So the whole idea is the approvals to control that. So I'm going to pick hotel. Let's pick the date. So we'll say I stayed over um, for that particular journey. Is there a receipt attached? I'm going to say yes this time because I'll cover off attachments. You can do obviously for your fuel receipts as well. Multi-currency. So if you utilize the exchange rates and the currencies you've got set up in Sage, I'll put just £85 for that hotel. Uh, again, you can set the exchange rate. You've got your um, nominal account. I'll pick, I'll pick a project again. Now, actually, if you are using the projects, what you can do is start to uh, start to type in, and it'll filter, it'll filter as well. So let's just uh, pick there. I do need to enter description. So overnight stay for meeting. Under extras. Did I pay for dinner for a group of people or was it entertainment? Uh, I love this one. <laughs> Don't think anybody ever says, yes, I had alcohol, but it's an option in there that somebody's asked for over time. So we've added that in as a flag. Then you get to attachments. So we can go electronic with receipts. It depends on where you're doing this as to how it works. Myself, even though I've got access to the app, I've got access to, and I say I do it on my iPad. I still like to do it here when I'm in the office. So I tend to take photographs and just upload them to OneDrive or iCloud. Uh, and then I get the folder and I just simply, sorry, let's go for that one this time. I just simply drag and drop just as you did before. And there's my receipt here. If I'm doing it on my iPad though, when I click on that button, it will ask me, do you want to take a photo or go to the gallery? Or because uh, I've got the uh, latest iOS, they've now got um, a folder so you can actually search for the file. If you're doing it on the app, there's a paper clip in the corner. So if I add that, there's my there's my overnight stay. Now for corporate credit cards, you've got two options. Option number one is you can, so you, well, the first thing you do is you, you set up the card numbers and link them to an employee and obviously link them to the appropriate purchase ledger account. So for us, we use Lloyd's. So I've got my unique business card all linked back. So option number one is I can mix and match on this um, single expense there saying, is it personal or is it card? But we can import a, a statement. So what Vicky does, Vicky is our finance manager. She will download that statement. Uh, she, we then configure the back end. So she imports that statement in and it matches off the transactions to the card number and then creates an expense claim for each of the people on there. Vicky then emails to say, can you please do your business card expenses? Now for me, it makes my life so much easier because I'd, I'd often go, well, I've got the receipt. Did I pay company card? Did I pay for not? And because I've got the same uh, card, both 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 um, Mastercards. Again, I don't know. I don't know which one which one I use. So it's made my life a lot easier. Makes Vicky's life a lot easier because with the expense claim, I can't delete any lines. It all has to reconcile. So when we've had team members accidentally use the card for their uh, weekly shop, they still have to submit the expense and then obviously reclaim that back. So the lines have to. You can split the lines. So. Perhaps it's Starbucks, uh, you've, and part of it's valuable, part of it's not, but it all has to reconcile. You attach your receipt, you pick the correct category, put your description in, submit and it goes through, and then gets posted as an invoice or multiple invoices because it's come from multiple people against the Lloyd's credit card statement, um, purchase ledger account. So it makes everybody's lives easier. Now I can print an expense voucher because often to go fully electronic can be a little nerve wracking, but uh, so I can print that out, stay for the receipts, but I can submit this, and as I said, I worked from Cheltenham. Mine gets approved by the managing director first before going to Vicky for final. Uh, so I'd always recommend somebody in finance just check in from a VAT perspective. But I've never had to submit hard copies, just did it remotely. 
So in the same theme, you can probably guess by now that Corey's my approver. It doesn't have to be Corey, by the way. <laughs> Obviously you can choose, but it's just easier for uh, easier for demonstrating. So I can either click on the link here, down here, or I could just go into the menu and approve. So in terms of the, there it is just there at the bottom. So as we expand, again, you can have your nominal budgets. There's the mileage. So if I click there, I can see the journey details. I can click here to see a copy of the receipt. And that, if that's multi-page, you can be able to see the multi-page. I can see the values. So I'm checking, am I happy with this? That it's in line with the policy. If I go to details, I can see the nominal. If I really need to, I don't. I tend to just check the VAT. But Vicky's checking, making sure she's happy. Is she happy with the currencies that we've put in? Again, we've got the budgets, all those other elements that you'd expect. You can approve or reject. All of that's exactly the same. I'm just going to approve all. Approval rates can be multi level, as I said earlier. So from mine to Richard and then to Vicky. Till such time as once it's fully approved, it will then post in this because it's personal expenses to Sandra's account will be sat there ready to be paid at the appropriate time. There it is. The expense or the reference is the expense ID so we can find that easily inside a WAP. Because I'm using Cycon documents, it's also pulled down a copy of the receipts as well so I can see those uh, inside of Sage. I could find them in WAP as well if I wanted to. And if I look at the nominal, there's our postings and what we've got because we're using WAP again, it's pulled down the descriptions. So those are the three most popular modules, I would say, you know, the ones which um, they're not really reliant on other other elements, uh, certainly requisitions and invoice approvals. Um, for almost every every demonstration expenses. As people look down the list tends to be a nice to have, but there are some other modules in there which which again customers find useful, but obviously only if it's if it's uh, for a relevant reason. So if I log back into Sandra, we've got timesheets. So as I mentioned earlier, being able to link that now again, we do have some customers where they're just capturing time. And they want to report in it through WAP, so you can do that. But I would get, I would say sort of 80% plus it's because they're recording time against projects, whether that's Sage project accounting or Sycons. Now, because I've used the holidays module and Sandra has a fully authorized holiday. It's actually populated a timesheet already and you can have an auto submit on a Sunday. If I come into last week, perhaps we need to add add a line on there. Sandra can come in, pick a project and a cost rate because that's how it's set up. You can have hours and minutes, it could be decimals or as mine is you uh, actually know. So some, somebody's changed it. Mine used to be start and end times, but actually it looks like it's hours and minutes now and I can add some notes in to that and I can submit that timesheet through and it would go through for approval. There is another option. So for some customers, and timesheets is always an interesting one because um, again, we've got software for construction industry, manufacturing, a lot of different verticals, but each one has its own challenge with timesheets. So for some people, if you're office based and you've got access to a computer, to be able to log in and do this or do it on your phone is great. But if it's um, in a more, uh, so say the construction sector where you've got people out on site, trying to get them to fill in a paper-based timesheet is hard enough. So to go, wow, we've got this new fandangled solution, use this, it's going to be difficult. So in that scenario, often they'll just type them into Sage and they'll just carry on capturing them as uh, paper-based timesheets. But what you can do with this is you can set those end users up as WAP users, but not give them access. They don't need to log in. But again, you can then put them into a business unit and the, it could be somebody in admin for that, for those group of people. It could be the line manager you can actually submit the timesheets just from this drop down. They just pick the people, fill in the timesheets. It can go through for approval before it's updating your projects in Sage. So again, we've thought of little things. Apologies, some of this might not be relevant for you, but it, it's just trying different ways to, to make the technology work, but also appreciating that every industry sector is uh, has its you know sort of different challenges. From a holidays perspective, the idea behind this is Sandra wants to create or uh, submit a new holiday. First things first, she can see her entitlement. 
So what, uh, how many days she's got, what she's submitted, what she's taken, etc. so far in the current holiday year, and you can open up future holiday years. What she's accrued. If you're using this with timesheets, then um, you can accrue toil. So Sandra could take some time with toil and also see a history of the requests as well as they were approved or if they're waiting, waiting for that as well. There's a calendar, so you can put the users within a business unit so Sandra can see quickly if other people are off and then she can just click on current request, the new request, add that in, goes through for approval. Once approved, as I said earlier, she'll get an iCal as well. So it's just a way of managing that. And then the other modules, sales orders, just mirrors out of conscious of time, but that just mirrors standard, uh, say, sales order. But you're able to do it through the web. You can see your stock levels. It does combine quite nicely with some of our distribution elements as well. Uh, and as I said, if you're selling stock items, if it sees that it drops below a margin, then it can go out for approval. And then the final one is just a mini HR. So there's a back end. It's not. This is a finance driven solution, which because of the other modules has naturally evolved uh, to have some HR capability. It's not a dedicated HR solution, but if you're just using spreadsheets at the moment, using WAP, then this is this is absolutely ideal to store job history and such, but also self-service. So Sandra can log in. As you can see again, because we've got holidays, those details, absence with Bradford Factor score, uh, there's grievances and disciplinaries. She can update her details, address details, uh, three emergency contacts, her bank details as well, if you want, with notifications going um, to to uh, to users in the back end to say bank account details have changed. Record sickness in there as well, or doctor's leave, for example, able to see the job history, both the current job, but also kind of probationary details, and then documents. So your appraisals attached as a uh, as a word document, any certificates, contracts of employment, any qualifications, and then also your company policies with uh, that's obviously uh, not a PDF that somebody's attached, but read and accept functionality as well. So you can control what people have seen. But uh, I'm three minutes inside Richard and Darren, so hopefully that gives you an idea. Of, it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of of the WAP solution said there's a wealth of information on our website of each of those modules. What I would always recommend is, you know, it's different for every every uh, customer. If there's things that you like in here, but you know, you want a tailored one to one session again, just let Richard and uh, Darren know. But are there any questions, Richard, or if, uh, is it stunned silence out there? It appears to be a stunned silence. I was just going to open the floor to questions. Um, obviously, if anybody wants to raise their virtual hand or, or put the question into the chat. We can pick up on those. I can see uh, I can see one being typed at the moment. I'll let Steve prepare himself for this one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it's uh, it's always worried. If we, is it going to be? I've never sat through. Oh, does the timesheet auto post once approved? Ah, it's a very very good point, Samantha. Um, yes. So what it will do is, um, if it's not linked to anything in Sage then it just stays in inside of WAP, as I said earlier. But if you've got Sycon projects or project accounting, then yes, the moment it's approved, it will post through to the project. Now, in Sycon projects, we actually handle it ever so slightly differently. Is the moment it's submitted, it will actually sit as a committed labor cost in the project. So you see it straight away in the project. And then once it's approved, it then moves to actual. So it does give you a bit more visibility than if you've just got the project accounting, but yes, it uh, it does it does auto post. There's no manual process for that. Brilliant. I can't see any other. Oh, there is. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as is always always the way. You'll be you'll be having lunch and you'll think, oh, I should have asked this question. So you know, just get in touch with with Darren and Richard. As I said, I'm happy to do a one to one. Appreciate there's a lot to cover, and it's you know it's one of those. I think to get through all of those modules in uh, under an hour is quite a challenge. I do talk fast, so you know it's probably easier for me than some others. But uh, thank you very much for sitting through today. Hopefully you found it interesting. And um, Richard, I will just sign off. I think it's politically correct these days to say stay safe. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Steve. Thanks everybody for uh, attending. Like I said, we have recorded the session, so we'll uh, yeah, we'll get it shared out to you as well. So if you do want to rewatch it, any questions or if you need to uh, discuss or interested in pricing again, uh, just reach out to myself or Darren.
but uh, yeah, stay safe and uh, hopefully uh, speak to you all soon.